I've been looking forward to this one. So, Allosaurus. Now I know this guy's been done to death almost as much as T-Rex or Velociraptor, but I feel like this theropod gets a bit of an unfair rep as being that generic theropod that anyone can think of after they've thought of the previous two that I just mentioned. But it was not generic, and let's get into why. Allosaurus is the theropod that is amongst the first we learn about as kids, probably because it's easier to say and is normally seen as T-Rex, but a bit smaller with three fingers instead of two. It does have one thing in common with T-Rex though, and that is that it was a really weird theropod for its time, more so than you might think at first. So the first remains of this theropod were found out in the Morrison Formation of Colorado in 1869, but it was officially described based on other specimens found by Offnil Charles Marsh in 1877, when he named Allosaurus fragilis, with Allosaurus literally meaning different lizard. Now we have O.C. Marsh to thank for the genus, but his streak didn't end up continuing. He named plenty of other genera that turned out to be just more Allosaurus, but was motivated less by science and more by a playground rivalry with Edward Drinker Cope. Oh, I've named more species than you today. No, you haven't. I've named ten times more than you. It's, it's a long story. Just, just go watch my Bone Wars video. Now the history of discovery goes across literally centuries with this animal, but to go into that in more detail would mean that I spoil other bits in the video and potentially another video that I'm going to be doing on this. I like my order. So in the meantime, let's take a look at an in-depth description of this animal and what that means. So this particular dinosaur falls within the family Allosauroids, which not only contains Allosaurus, but also Neovenator, Megaraptor, Acrocanthosaurus, Tyranotitan, Mapusaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and the famous, but now even more famous, Gigantosaurus. Like its kin, Allosaurus was a large theropod, even by Cretaceous standards, standing at around 28 to 30 feet long and weighing around 1.5 tons. But despite being on the larger side, its skull was fairly modest for a theropod, but like most other theropods, was lighter than it looks at first glance and quite strong for its lightness. Moving along the body, we see that, like many theropods, it had a furcula. Now, furculae are what we commonly call the wishbone, and it helps aid with flight, but much like feathers, this clearly isn't what they originally evolved for. Allosaurus, spoiler alert, didn't fly. But it is thought that these fused collarbones could expand and contract in order to help with the very efficient air sac respiratory system that dinosaurs had. Then we have the classic feature that most people use to distinguish this guy from T-Rex, the three-fingered claws. These digits are actually the first three of the forelimb, meaning they're the equivalent of the thumb, index finger, and middle finger. Now they were a lot bigger than many later theropods in comparison to the body size, but does this mean they were used more? Well, not exactly. There is every chance, even likelihood, that these claws were used for grasping prey, but you also have to remember that Allosaurus is a much earlier theropod than many we know of. Perhaps rather than being bigger and more useful than Tyrannosaurs or Abelosaurids, they were actually becoming smaller and more useless from when Theropod's ancestors were smaller and more quadrupedal. We just don't know. And now for the question that everyone asks about a Theropod, was it fuzzy? Same answer again. No idea. Skin impressions have been found from Allosaurus showing scales, but they've all been from the underside of the dinosaur, so it still remains possible that it had some sort of feathering along its back but we don't have any direct evidence of that, so scaly dinosaur fans, you can breathe easy for this round. Now, if I could only name one thing that Allosaurus is famous for, it's that head crest. Now, this is often referred to as a horn, but I just prefer to call it a crest, because to me, a horn is a separate piece of bone to the rest of the skull, whereas a crest is just an extension of bones that the rest of us have. But I've also heard definitions to say that a horn is just pointy and a crest isn't and Allosaurus's crest was kind of pointy, so don't, don't quote me on it. Anyway, what was this fashion accessory actually for? Well, it might have actually been a fashion accessory. Now, I know this has been said to death, but when structures like this are seen on dinosaurs, one of the most likely explanations is, say it with me now, display. Now we see that these crests also lead into a bumpy ridge along the nasal bones as we approach the front of the skull which is seen to some degree on most other Allosaurs, such as Gigantosaurus, which do talk more about here. Now there's no way for certain to say what these crests were for, 
Some say display, some say thermoregulation, others say intraspecies combat, some even say it's for shading their eyes. Why don't dinosaurs wear sunglasses? Because they're dead, you melt. Now, I'm going to offer my sixpence on this, but please remember I've never performed any specific studies on Allosaurus and this is just speculation. When it comes to physical weapons in actual combat, they were really quite fragile. A pair of 1.5 ton animals smashing their heads together would result in forces that these crests likely couldn't handle, even with the keratina sheath they were covered in. Now again, these are 1.5 ton, 30 foot long animals, so they also look to be just a bit too small for thermoregulation. This isn't out of the question completely, since maybe it helped thermoregulation along by a small amount, but its difference probably wouldn't have been that great. When it comes to rocking some shades, not only would it only have worked from certain angles, but this is also a really weird feature that isn't really seen much in the animal kingdom, especially Dinosauria. Now normally features develop in a species that look different but serve more or less the same purpose. My point here is that a lot of dinosaurs lived in sunny areas, but none of them developed much in terms of sunshades outside of Allosauria for just their eyes. So the odds that they were the only dinosaurs to do this seems somewhat low. But again, Allosaurus was a really weird animal, so even though it remains unlikely in my opinion, it's not necessarily completely out of the question. So the last option that we can think of as a likely explanation is display. Now I've said it before and I'll say it again. Birds are the masters of displays and they likely inherited this from other dinosaurs. This nasal ridge and crest likely supported keratin structures that Allosaurus would use to attract mates or in intraspecies threat displays. This often can mean that structures like these can change colour, but for this we normally see grooves on the surface of the bone for blood vessels that facilitate this colour change. And there doesn't appear to be any that we can see on these crests, at least not to the extent of, say, Stegosaurus' back plates. So it probably couldn't change colour for this display. Either way, these crests differed heavily between species along with a few other traits. Now, depending on who you ask, there are four different species of Allosaurus. Allosaurus fragilis, the type species, Allosaurus chimidseni, and possibly Allosaurus europaeus and Allosaurus maximus. But europaeus is considered dubious and maximus is more commonly referred to as a different genus, Saurophaganax. Allosaurus fragilis is the OG and normally the species that people are referring to, being around the average size and weights mentioned before with a deeper skull, slightly pointier head crests and a more pronounced nose ridge than Allosaurus jimidseni, which was on the larger side at up to two tons with a much longer, more carcharodontosaurid like skull with a larger but rounder head crest. Now there is one specimen of Allosaurus jimidseni that is particularly famous, but before I do get into that, I just wanted to let you guys know that I actually have a Patreon. Now there is a lot that I wanna do with this channel and you guys can support me with this as well as find out what other cool features you can gain access to by checking out the link in the description. Teaching and eventually researching paleontology is ultimately what I love doing in life and your support means that I can do that a lot more, so it would mean the world to me. Now let's talk about the Morrison neighborhood. So I do talk about the Morrison formation in my Stegosaurus video, but I hate that video, mostly because I didn't see anything wrong with how I was talking until I made a comeback and actually started talking like a normal person. So I'll go back over it again. The Morrison Formation is one that existed during the late Jurassic between 156.3 and 146.8 million years ago in the Midwest of the good old US of A. The outcrops can be found namely in Wyoming, Colorado, and both Dakotas. So the area overlapped where T-Rex and Triceratops once roamed, albeit 90 million years or so earlier. Now this area was one with seasonal dry spells, which was weird for the Jurassic, but showcased the changing times going into the Cretaceous. As the area was uplifted, it became a savanna rife with rivers, lakes, swamps and mudflat floodplains that was very prone to droughts. Now if you do want to find out more about what a typical Jurassic site would have looked like, then be sure to check out my Jurassic video here. Covering much of these lands were cycads, tree ferns and horsetails which were all riparian, meaning they lived along the many rivers of the area. In these rivers and saline lakes were various species of fish, mollusks, lysamphibians, turtles and crocodilians. Further on land we see sporadic mammals and lizards along with, of course, pterosaurs and plenty of dinosaurs. These dinosaurs included Camptosaurus, Dryosaurus and Stegosaurus, 
alongside loads of sauropods like Camarasaurus, Supersaurus, Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus. Also yes those last two are two separate genera but I'll go into more of that in my Apatosaurus video. Now the high amount of different sauropods definitely stands out here but paleontologists all seem to agree that this was likely due to migrations and the fact that they all had different feeding niches so weren't stepping on each other's toes. And these herbivores were very much needed to feed the many hungry mouths of the theropods that existed here. These included Ornitholestes, Tanicolagraeus, Torvosaurus and Ceratosaurus. Now when it comes to larger species such as Ceratosaurus, it's thought that they didn't step on the toes of Allosaurus since they may have preferred hunting along the many rivers and more forested areas, whereas Allosaurus probably preferred the open floodplains. Either way, Allosaurus was the biggest predator of this environment and an apex predator. Speaking of which, we need to talk about how Allosaurus hunted. Allosaurus had the usual tools for a hunting theropod, such as powerful legs, clawed forelimbs for grasping, and limited binocular vision. It did have something that made it special though. Studies found that Allosaurus had a fairly weak bite, but hugely strong necks. It also had articulations in its skull similar to snakes, though not quite as exaggerated, and was capable of opening its jaws to a whopping 92 degrees. So what's going on? Well, paleontologists have been arguing about this for decades now. Many support the theory that Allosaurus would use its head like a hatchet, slamming its open jaws down to slice flesh away rather than just biting. Now this is supported by the strength and placement of the neck muscles, as well as the vertical strain that the skull was capable of despite the weak bite. But other studies have deemed this unlikely and suggested the wider gape and strong neck was to give direct attacks to large prey items. Now these larger prey items included sauropods, both living and scavenged. Now, not many animals really hunted sauropods since, you know, they probably outweighed them. But some theropods may have done and likely would have used teamwork to do it. This potentially includes Allosaurus, but specimens with intraspecies injuries suggest that they were pretty aggressive with each other. So if they did, it was likely a short-term alliance similar to Komodo dragons. They may have preferred juveniles, but it has been suggested that Allosaurus chose to graze on living animals that were much bigger than it, taking enough chunks to feed on, but not enough to kill the animal. This is not only safer for the Allosaurus, but also means that it can come back at a later time on the same animal for another tasty morsel. Now, strong bite isn't really needed to get anything vital or pin anything down, and that wide mouth gape means that you can get as much meat as possible in a single bite. Another infamous victim of Allosaurus was Stegosaurus, with the latter having been found with Allosaurus bite marks. Stegosaurus did not go down without a fight though. One specimen of Allosaurus shows a partially healed injury on its tail vertebra near the groin from the Thagomizer, or tail spike from a Stegosaurus. Ouch. Basically, don't mess with a Stegosaurus, because it will shank you in your dick. Now, speaking of particular specimens, I would be remiss not to mention Big Al, and Big Al the second. Now these guys deserve an episode of their own, which I will do, but these are basically some of the most complete and well-preserved specimens of a dinosaur full stop. So much so that paleontologists have been able to tell almost exactly what kind of life it lived from details on the skeleton that aren't available anywhere else. But I'll go into more detail about these specimens when I catch you guys next time.